All right. So if there's any specific um, problems you guys want to start out with, we can start with those. Otherwise, I'll probably go through um, and do some hypothesis testing. So it looks like problem 10 here, probably start with that. Which ones did we go through last class, right? Yeah, we, we went through one through four. Okay. So, um, and I'll kind of mention some things as I go through these as well that kind of apply more generally to hypothesis testing um, and some questions that I've seen kind of come in for, for those. So I think um, generally these proportional ones aren't too bad um, because you don't have the confusion of which distribution do I use, right? Anytime you see proportion, right, this sample proportion or the word proportion, we automatically should be thinking about we get to use that standard normal or that Z table. All right, so there should be no confusion on that one, which distribution we need to use. Right? So what if we want to do the 95% confidence interval, right? We find a sample proportion of 0.55. What we're going to do is build our confidence interval around that sample proportion, right? Go a certain amount to the right and a certain amount to the left, get our lower and upper bound. Okay? So then the kind of question becomes, all right, which equation do I need to use? Right. So if we look at this formula sheet, kind of a reminder, I mean, these are trying to indicate CI, these are our kind of confidence intervals, right? These are the three different types of examples we could see for confidence intervals. Here's our test statistics, right? Well, we're doing a confidence interval problem, so that doesn't apply, but just kind of so you can see how this is organized. So we have a sample proportion, so we're going to use this, this guy right here, right? We're given that sample proportion of 0.55, so we plug that in. We were given the sample size. And I don't, whoops, not that. I don't remember what that was now. We're still working off practice exam A, by the way. So we have a sample size of 40, right? So we plug in 40 for a sample size. Now the only thing left to do is look up that Z score. Right? So essentially what we're doing with kind of finding this Z value, right, is whatever alpha level we want, so we have 0.55, we want to go a certain number of standard deviations to the left and to the right. So the number of standard deviations you want to go, that's what a z-score represents. So you almost think about it as you've got alpha over 2 outside your interval, right? or something kind of like, it almost looks, you can envision, it's kind of like a two-tailed test. Right? So I want to find the z-value that gives me that alpha over 2 Kind of in that lower left tail and alpha over two in that upper tail, right? Now, here we're going a certain number of standard deviations below. Here we're going a certain number of standard, standard deviations above. Right? So look up alpha over two. If I remember right, it was 95% confidence level. So our alpha is 0 0.05, which means we'll have 0 0.025 on either side of this confidence interval that we built. So I go to my table. That's not the table. Here's my standard normal table. I know the area that I want in the tail, so I'm gonna look that value up in the middle. All right, so 0 0.025 right here. I go over 1.96. Right. So that's gonna be the Z value that I need to plug in to this confidence interval equation here. And, and notice, I mean, if you identify this as the confidence interval equations, which Hopefully, by the time you take the exam, like that should be very clear. That's what these three are, right? CI, confidence interval, write it next to the formula sheet or, you know. Um, so we plug that in. Now it's just a matter of getting that entered into our equation, right? We plug 0.55 in for the sample portion, 40 in for our sample size, and now 1.96 was that Z value we wanted, right? So if I do that right now, don't even have to cheat and look at the answer key. So 0.396-ish. So 0.396 is what I would get if I calculated the lower bound. I can go ahead and calculate the upper bound. I'll get 0.704, but notice once I have the lower bound, I can identify what the correct answer is. So if I'm trying to think of ways to save time, maybe just calculate the lower bound and kind of move on. And if you have time at the end, come back and kind of just double check and try to calculate the upper bound as well, right? The only difference there is you'd be adding kind of that margin of error. So if we look at the formula sheet again, 
right? I subtracted to find the lower, this, this margin of error to find the lower bound. I would add it to find the upper bound, okay? So it shouldn't be too bad. Right? Haven't seen as many questions come in on the confidence intervals. But hypothesis testing is a little bit more tricky, right? So let's say that the NCAA reports that 45% of their, their athletic programs report a positive profit amount. You wanna test for whether or not that true population proportion uh, is anything different than 45%, right? So anytime you see, you know, kind of if you're reading through this problem, whatever you're trying to find, whatever you're trying to test for, that's your alternative hypothesis, right? So here I wanna know is the, you know, proportion of schools that earn a positive profit, profit different than 45%, which would be a proportion of 0.45. So here we're thinking about different than that value. Anytime we see the word different than, you should automatically be thinking I have a not equal to sign in my alternative hypothesis, right? Yeah. Exactly, right? As soon as you see that word different than, right? That should tell you the alternative hypothesis is gonna be, is that proportion anything different than 0.45? Is it not equal to 0.45, right? So that's gonna be our alternative hypothesis. So we assume the opposite is true, which is that it's equal to 0.45, okay? Any questions on that one before I keep moving here? Okay with that? <clears throat> so uh, the next step, right? Hopefully this isn't too tricky either when it comes to test statistics. I'm dealing with a proportion example, right? And I want to find a test statistic. So instead of trying to memorize these formulas, go here, print this out or pull up the Word document right kind of next to this or in, you know, insert a uh, text box next to it or something. These are your three test statistic equations. We have three different types of examples. One, if we were looking at a sample mean and we had a known population variance. One, if we had a sample mean and we had a, only a sample variance. Notice the difference there. There's still test statistics, but this is a Z statistic because it comes from the standard normal distribution. This one we would call, maybe call a T statistic because it comes from the student T distribution. However, if we're dealing with proportions, hopefully we never make, have to make that mistake because if we have a sample proportion, this is the only test statistic equation that has a sample proportion in it. All right, so we'll plug in our sample proportion here. I'll zoom in a little bit. So we plug in our sample proportion of, I don't even remember what it was, 0.55, I think. Uh, where was this? There we go. Yeah, 0.55, okay. We had that assumed true proportion of 0.45, right? That's what we were assuming that proportion was equal to 0.45. Plug in 0 0.45, 0 0.45. Sample size was 40. You know, these are ones which it's hard for me to give too much instruction after we identify, you know, after I explain, the, you know, how you identify what test statistical equation to use. At that point, it's just a matter of plugging those values in, right? I even kind of, you know, notated the sample proportion in the problem when you were given the information. So 0.55, plug that in. Hopefully we're pretty comfortable now, you know, knowing N is our sample size. And then that assumed true proportion comes from that null and alternative hypothesis. So whatever value is in that null and alternative hypothesis, we should be plugging that in there. On the exam, what I would probably do in a question like this, because notice, if you got this one wrong, right, let's say I put 0.55, or I incorrectly selected the null alternative, well, I'm gonna be plugging the wrong value in here. So what I'd likely do on the exam is something like, assume that instead, the you know, null alternative hypothesis that you have is this, right, and give you kind of a new starting point so that you have, you know, you're all kind of working with the, the same value. You don't have kind of cascading errors. Oh, I saw someone's hand up for a second, sorry. So, I, I mean, at that point, it's really just a matter of being able to plug those values into that formula, right? Now, right away, we should know that. We can know, we can at least narrow some, some things down or prevent ourselves from making some easy mistakes. So I know that my, sample proportions should be normally distributed around whatever that true population proportion is. Well, I've assumed it's 0.45. So if in fact that is the true value, they should be normally distributed around that. I found a sample proportion of 0.55, right? So if I'm thinking about, let's see, make sure this ends up on it. Turning this into kind of my Z statistic here, what should the sign be? at all. 
What should the sign of my Z statistic be? If I look at the assumed true proportion, this is kind of the mean. If I were to turn that into a Z value, what should that have a Z value of? The mean will always, well, not six, but the mean will always have a, a, a Z value of zero. So if I see anything above the assumed true mean, that Z statistic will have to be positive. If I see any sample evidence below the assumed true value, that's going to be a negative test statistic or a negative Z statistic, right? And that applies to any example. Anytime we're looking at kind of calculating a test statistic, if you just draw this out, plot that assumed true value, plot the sample evidence you found, you should at least know what the sign of your test statistic will be. So we know it's going to be positive. So we can rule out D. Can't really rule the other three out, but we can rule out D. Right? Yeah. So from that null, you're getting 0.55 just from C and D. C and D. Well, just like those. No, no, no. Sorry. So use this information for the uh, following five. This is like they're all kind of kind of runs. Yeah, yeah. So we're taking this information, adding, in, and this and the exam will be kind of set up similar, right? I'll start out like a batch of four or five questions. I might give you some initial information. And I tried to make it like more ref, like on the exam, reference the thing found in question, you know, whatever the question was before it. Um, but yeah, we're using this information for kind of the next five questions. Right? So at that point, it's a matter of kind of entering it into our calculator. Yeah. The, the assumed true value. So we're looking at, so in here we have an assumed true population proportion. Or if we had an assumed true population mean, it's always going to be zero, right? Because remember when we said, if you think about what our test statistic equation was, and I won't write out this here, but that assumed true value, well, if I'm thinking about turning that same value into a, a test statistic, I would just be taking P, you know, the assumed true report, so it's always going to be zero. And the same thing if I had an assumed true mean, then I would just be subtract. Yeah, so we'll always have kind of that, that Z value, or if we're doing a student T example, a T value kind of up zero there on my laptop bag. All right. So what do we get if we enter all that in? So point, what, 55 five minus 0.45 divided by the square root of, is it 40 our sample size, I believe? So you should get about 1.27 if we round it to the second decimal, okay? Any question on up to that point? So those test statistic ones, like once you identify the formula, it should be like, I don't wanna say easy points, but it's really just a matter of like typing in it in your calculator, right? Okay, any questions on that one? So what if we want to find critical values? So I've been getting a lot kind of more, more questions about how we find critical values for on these practice exams or on the connect homework. So right away, if I have a right tailed test, right? That means that only evidence on the right side can go against the null, right? Because for a, we'll do a, my alternative, my null, right tail test, let's say we use that 0.45, less than or equal to, right? So only sample proportions that are above 0.45 would go against this null, right? So for a right tail test, the only way we can reject the null is if we see something on the right hand side, which should remind us our critical values also come from that right hand side. So same sort of idea. If the center of that distribution, whether or not it's a standard normal or a student T, they both have a mean of zero. If I'm looking at a right tail test, all my critical values will be on the right hand side. My critical values have to be positive. If I had a left tail test, right? Let's say maybe instead we were doing something like this. Now only evidence on, that's below that assumed true value goes against the null. So for a left tail test, my critical values will be on the left side, which means they have to be negative. And for a two tail test, I could see evidence that is above 0.45 or below 0.45. They would both go against the assumption that it's equal to 0.45. So 
So for a two-tailed test, I'll have a pair of critical values, right? Positive and negative, they'll be the same value, but one positive, one negative. So right away when we're looking at these possible answers, if I had a two-tailed test, right? Once again, on the exam, I'd probably give you a different assumed null and alternate hypothesis. So if you got this one wrong, it you know, wouldn't have cascading effects. But assuming that you know, we found this correct, if it's a two-tailed test, what are the only possible options here? Yeah, I just said, right? You have to have pairs of critical values, one positive, one negative at each alpha, right? So A and C are the only ones that make sense here. Now, how do we kind of distinguish between the two? I'm just going to redraw this. So we're looking at that standard normal distribution. We have a two-tailed test. If we just look up that very first one, we can identify the correct answer. Right? I mean, once we know one of the, you know, the, the 10 percent one, we can identify what the correct answer is up there. So we want these kind of two Z values that would give us alpha total now not just in one tail, but in the tails, right? So if alpha total is in the tails, each tail would have alpha over two. Remember I said it's very similar to kind of the, the confidence intervals when we do a two-tailed test. So if I want alpha over two, if I want to do that when alpha is equal to 0.1, so I first start out with that 10% level, I'll have 0 0.05 in each tail, All right? So I go to my standard normal table. Oh, it shows up. Oh no. All right, let me reopen it. There we go. So I try to find the closest value to 0.05 in that lower left tail as I can. So I scroll down here. Looks like it's in between these two values. So 1.64 and 1.65, negative 1.64 and 1.65. So negative 1.65. So if I go here, now I kind of rounded to the second decimal here, right? So this would actually be kind of out to the third decimal. So not 1.65, but 1.645, right, kind of splitting the difference there. Positive and negative, if I find the 10% critical value, well, now I, now I can identify which of these is correct, right? So I could look up the other two doing the same thing. So 0 0.05 divided by two, look that up in the table, I'd find 1.96. 0 0.01 divided by two, looked it up in my standard normal table, I'd find 2.58, right? So those would be kind of my three pairs of critical values for those three different alphas. Now, Another way you could do this, right? And I think if you can remember this, it actually makes it a little easier. But remember, on that student T table, this last row was very helpful. Because this last row, if we could have an infinite degrees of freedom, which is just theoretical, it's not actually possible in application. But if we could get it to be infinite, we would, our student T distribution would be exactly what the standard normal distribution is. So this last row of the student T table is actually telling you what values you would find from the standard normal distribution. So notice when we just looked up 0 0.05, right? We would have found 1.645, right? Because it was in between 1.64 and 1.65. 1.96, it's exactly what we would have found if we looked up the alpha of 0 0.05 and we divided it by two. 0 0.01 divided by two is 0 0.005. If we looked that up here, we'd see, we don't just have to round it to 2.58, we would know it's 2.576, right? We can kind of go out to the third decimal if we want to use this table, okay? Now, I personally think this is easier because like when I'm looking up critical values for multiple levels, I can just look them all up at the same time. Um, but if you're just more comfortable kind of doing one at a time, looking them up on the, the Z table, that's fine as well. You'll find the same values. Just here, they'll be rounded to the second decimal, okay? Any questions on that? Okay with that? In the end would be 39. Or the degrees of freedom. So here, the only time we have to worry about degrees of freedom is when, and the confidence intervals kind of remind you of this equations, is if we're looking at a sample mean with only a sample variance. No other time do we need to worry about degrees of freedom, right? 
So I, all I was saying was if you had a, if you had an example where you were using the standard normal distribution, you could use this last row of the student t table with the degrees of freedom of infinity. Because that's essentially what a, a uh, standard normal distribution is. It's a student t distribution with an infinite degrees of freedom. Yeah. So, yeah, if you have a proportion example, degrees of freedom should be the last thing on your mind, right? The only time you need to worry about it is if you have a sample mean and you only have a sample variance. Okay. All right, so 14. Let's assume you found the test statistic before was 1.34. What would the p-value be and what would the rejection decision be at an alpha of 0.1? Right. So if you were really confident with your answer from 13, you could use those critical values and plot that against this test statistic, right? Use the critical value approach. So if I have my test statistic, right, I could kind of come up with my rejection decision by plotting against the critical values. Now that doesn't help me find the p-value, right? Yeah. Or sorry, I could use, so if I wanted to use the critical value approach, I have the critical value for the 10% level. So I could use my pair of critical values at the 10% level I was saying critical values. I meant like the, the pair of, should, I should have said pair of critical values um, and then plot my test statistic against those, right? Now that doesn't help me get the p-value, but I, I could get the rejection decision that way. This one specifically wants the p-value. So we're going to have to go ahead and use that p-value approach. Right? So if we want to do that. What we're thinking about is once I find the test statistic, remember my test statistic is a Z statistic. It's a Z value. So it's coming from that standard normal distribution. So if I found 1.34, the P value would be the probability that I saw something like that. I saw the sample evidence that I did that was as far away from the assumed true kind of mean or population proportion here, or something even further that goes against the null. Now here we have to remember we're dealing with a two tailed test. Right, I kind of erased it, but we had the two-tailed test. So this represents half my p-value. It would have been equally as likely for me to see something that was 1.34 standard deviations below. And if I saw something on either side here, it goes against the null, right? So for a two-tailed test, whatever area I find in the one tail, I'll need to make sure that I multiply it by two, right? Because I have an equally sized tail on the other side. So I can look up kind of this Z value of 1.34. The table will tell me the area to the left. I want the area to the right, right? So I'm gonna to have to subtract whatever I find on the table from one, okay? Now, so we'll do it that way first and then I'll kind of mention something else. So let's look up 1.34 on our table. Scroll down here, 1.3. Four, so 0 0.9099, so 0 0.9099, which I wanted the area to come to the right of that Z value of 1.34, so I need to subtract that from one, I'll get what, 0 0.9091, but that's not my total P value, right? That's just the area in this right tail. So I then need to multiply it by two. If I do that, I think it's what, 0 0.18, excuse me, 0, 02. So that's my P value, right? So if we look at our answers, there's only one that has that as the P value. So I can actually don't even have to really go ahead and make the rejection decision because it doesn't matter. I know that C is the right answer, right? But just in case, right? C wasn't like I gave you two options with 0.8, you know, 1802. How would I make that rejection decision? Okay. Well, we only reject if the p-value is less than alpha. My p-value is 0 0.1802. The alpha we were told was 0 0.1. It's not less than 0 0.1, so I fail to reject, or I do not reject the null. Okay? Do you have a question?
Yeah, 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 yeah. So here we were only behind the value. Yeah. So here we were only testing against one alpha, right? So it was a little bit easier. I could actually here test against several alphas at once, right? I could say is 0.18 less than 0.1? No, I failed to reject. Is it less than 0 0.05? No, I failed to reject. Is it less than 0 0.01? No, I failed to reject. Any questions on that before you? All right, I want to show you one other way you could have done this. If you re remembered it was a two-tailed test right away, and you knew that just because you found a test statistic of 1.34, it would have been equally as likely to have seen a test statistic of negative 1.34, and that would have went against the null as well. So if I want to, I kind of walked you through kind of how you would find the area to the right of your test statistic here, but you could have known, well, this is going to be the same sized area as the area below negative 1.34. So I could have just looked up negative 1.34 on the table. Then I don't have to worry about subtracting it from one, right? If I look that up, I'll prove it to you, but you would have found 0 0.0901 multiply it by two and you would you know, come up with the same p-value. So if I instead had looked up kind of the negative test statistic, since it was a two-tailed test, so we go down here. Where's the four column right here? Okay, so negative 1.34, 0 0.0901, right? So we would have found, so negative 1.34, the area to the left of it, 0 0.0901. So could have looked up kind of that, but that kind of, in order to do that, you have to kind of remember for a two-tailed test, it would have been equally as likely for you to see that same test statistic, but negative. Right? And then you could have used that to find the, the area to the left instead. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay with that? So one thing I would say to remember um, just in general, because like I said, I know I've noticed a lot of people having problems with critical values. One way in which you can really greatly reduce the difficulty initially is like for a right tail test, remember that critical values are always positive. Left tail test, critical values are always negative. And for a, well, I guess I can write the number here, two tail test will always have kind of a pair of critical values. Right? And the exception for the two-tailed test, it's really kind of like the critical values that give you alpha over two in each tail because you'll have two tails. And here you're just thinking about kind of alpha either in your right tail or alpha in just your left tail. Okay. So maybe that's a good way to kind of keep track of it. Um, any questions on that or any specific problems you guys want to go through? Maybe even connect problems if you really wanted to. No? Okay. So uh, we did these last class. So we went through one through four at the beginning of last class, right? So kind of extending from those same examples, right? What happens? Right, so I think we did, oh, we just did the uniform ones, right? So we'll kind of take a step back and look at some old stuff as well here, and just to get some more kind of familiarity with that. Um, on Monday, I'll probably just do hypothesis testing problems, but here I want to make sure we go over some old stuff. So I have this normally distributed variable that has a mean of 3,700 and a variance of 250,000, right? So what's the probability that I see someone consume more than 3,000 calories a day, right? So this, was, this random variable is for calorie consumption. Right? So we want greater than 3,000. We have the mean. We have the standard deviation. So right away, we should be thinking about is we have this normally distributed variable. It's nice and easy. I don't have assumed true means. I don't you know, have building confidence. I, I know what the population mean is. And so I know that for that random variable x, it's normally distributed around 3,700. I found, you know, I want this cutoff value of 3,000. I want to find what's the probability that someone consumes more than 3,000. So if I just draw this out right away, what does this probability have to be greater than? 
0.5, right? Because the area to the right of the mean is 0.5. So I think on this one right away, if I just go look at the possible answers, I can rule out A, D doesn't make any sense. I'm looking for a, the probability. Probabilities have to be between zero and one, right? So A and D are ruled out. These two are, are above 0.5, right? But what would have to be true if the answer C was correct? So if the area to the right of 3000 was 0 0.5011, I would actually have to have see something that was like really, really close to whatever the mean is, right? Because the area to the right of me, the mean is 0.5. So if I wanted the area to the right of the value to be 0 0.5011, it would, I, I'm not gonna see something that's as far away from the mean as I have. So if I'm just throwing darts at this one without even wanting to do any math, I'm probably thinking that that 0.9, whatever it was, makes more, the most sense as an answer. Now, if I actually want to, you know, if I had some more uh, interesting other possible answers, how would I actually find what that probability is? Well, if we look at that formula sheet, and we go over here, this is kind of our uniform distribution stuff. The next stuff is, well, what if I just have a normally distributed variable, and I want to turn some cutoff value into a z-value? I take that value, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, right? It was as simple as that, okay? So I wanna turn this into a Z value, right? Once I have that Z value, I then want this area to the right. How do I turn that into a Z value? I take that cutoff value I'm interested in, subtract the mean. Now here I need to divide by the standard deviation. I was given the variance. So I could do this one of two ways. I could first find the standard deviation, which would just be the square root of that variance that we were given, 250,000. Or I could just plug, you know, I could and then plug that into my denominator. Make myself a little more room here. Or I could just plug it in to the denominator, the square root of 250,000. Right? Either way, I could do an intermediate step or not. Once I do that, I believe one, so it's going to be 500, I think this should be negative 1.4. I'm doing math in my head correct there. So I've got a Z value of negative 1.4. I go to the table to look that up. Negative 1.40, right? Negative 1.4, the second decimal is zero. So 0 0.0808. So 0 0.0808. But remember, don't look at the answers and then go, oh, 0 0.0808, that's the answer, right? Because if I drew this out, I rem remind myself, I want to remember we said we knew the probability had to be greater than 0.5 because I wanted the area to the right of it, right? So to find the area to the right, I have to subtract that from one. So 0.9192, okay? Any questions on that one? Okay. All right. What if I want the probability that it's between 3,200 or 4,200? So now, Oh, wait, actually, no, I lied to you. I want it to be less than 3,200 or greater than 4,200, right? So on these problems, I think it always helps to just draw this out, right? So we kind of are working with the same numbers, right? So let's say I've got this variable. I know it's kind of centered around 3,700. I want the probability that it's less than 3,200 or greater than 4,200. So I go through the same process. I'm gonna turn this into a Z value, right? To find the area to the left of it, right? So take that value, subtract the mean, divide by now, what is my standard deviation here? If I take the square root of 250,000, it's 500, okay? So I plug 500 into here, I find a Z value of negative one. Right? If 
everyone okay with that? Okay. So, go to my table. I look up negative 1, 0 0.00, 0 0.1587. Okay. So, 0.1587 is the area to the left. Now, if I look at this, if I have some easy numbers like this, right away I could have known what that z value is, right? How far away is 3,200 from the mean? 500. What's my standard deviation? So I'm one standard deviation below the mean, which is a z-score of negative one. Right? So sometimes I'll give these easier numbers, and like if you can kind of recognize that, I mean, you kind of are actually doing this formula in your head. It just doesn't feel like it. Right? Maybe it feels a little bit easier there. So now I have to turn 4,200 into a z-value and find the area to the right of that. However, if I ever give you problems like this, I've likely chosen numbers that happen to make things a little bit easier. Right? That you don't have to like use the table more than one time. So what do, what do you notice about how far away 4,200 is from 3,700? It's 500 away, which is the same distance as 3,200 was. So it's gonna have a z-score of what? positive one. And I can plug the numbers into my z-score equation and prove that to myself, right? Use 4,200 here instead. But if the area to the left of negative one is 0.1587, what's the area to the right of positive one? Same exact thing, right? You know, if I really want to, I could look up one in the table and give me the area to the left. I want the area to the right so I could subtract it from one. But, you know, if I remember these kind of principles that this is a symmetric distribution, the area to the left of negative one should be the same as the area to the right of positive one. This one actually, I can save myself some work. Right? Other things I might sometimes do is maybe I would have asked, like, what's the probability it's less than 3,200 or greater than 3,700? In which case, you know that you could be adding 0.1587 to 0.5, right? So, you know, and instead of 4,200, I just asked, was it greater than 3,700? Well, I'm really asking, is it greater than the mean? That's a probability of 0 0.5 there. Okay. But that wasn't what this problem asked. So just kind of giving you some additional things that might pop up on the unit. Okay. All right. So those ones shouldn't be too bad. But now what happens? So, oh, and if we do that, sorry, the final answer would be 0 0.3174, right? If we had 0.1587 in each tail, add them together, you get 0.3174. Now, what about if we instead, from that normally distributed variable, take a random sample of 25 people? So we said the central limit theorem, we needed at least 30 observations, but that was only if the original variable wasn't normally distributed. We have a variable that, we're, that is, and so we're, you know, we're okay. We know that if we take a sample of 25, our sample means will be normally distributed and they should be normally distributed around whatever the original mean of the data we sampled from was, right? So when I think about the distribution of my sample means, that's really what I'm drawing out in every hypothesis test equation when we have a sample mean, right? And what we said was, well, in the hypothesis test problems, we were saying those sample means should be normally distributed around the assumed true mean, but if we actually knew what the population mean was, what we're, you know, what we're really saying is that sample means will be distributed around whatever the true population mean is, right? In this case, we sampled from that normal variable that had a population mean of 3,700. So you almost think about this as the mean of my sample means is whatever the original population mean was, which was in this case, 3,700. Now, if I want to find the variance of my sample means, and I'll show you on the, the formula sheet where this equation is, but all that is is the original population variance divided by my sample size. Right? So here, 250,000 was my original population variance from the data, like, data I sampled from, divided by kind of 25 here, I think I should be left with, what, 10,000? Yeah. 
Okay, so so if I want not the variance though, right? I want the standard deviation. I have to do one slightly other thing. So if we look at our formula sheet, here is that equation for finding the variance of our sample means. It was the original variance over the sample size. But remember, if I want to find this standard deviation, all I have to do is take the square root of that. Right? So I found that the variance was 10,000. So my standard deviation, got my equal sign here, hold on. <laughs> so my standard deviation for my sample means should be equal to the square root of the variance, which the variance was 10,000. So I should have a standard deviation of 100. Okay. So the mean of my sample means would be 3,700. The standard deviation of my sample means should be 100. Okay. Now, if we go back here, this will be the one problem in which it's really important you can identify. I mean, you, you could get seven wrong and still do eight just fine if, because, of, because of the formula sheet. But kind of from here on, you know, these next two questions, you're going to need to know that you're dealing with the distribution of sample means, right? You're no longer looking at just the regular variable. You're now thinking about what's the probability that I see kind of the sample mean for these 25 people be less than 3,550, right? So if I want the probability that the sample mean is less than that 3,550, What I'm really thinking about visually here is I want this area. So right away, I know this area has to be less than what value? 0.5, because the area to the left of the mean would be 0.5. What do I need to do? Well, I need to turn this into a Z value right? and then find the area to the left of that Z value. Well, I can't use my old Z equation because that was just if I was looking at some random variable X. Now I'm looking at sample means. So I go to my formula sheet, I go down. Oops, actually, I think it's all the way up here. Here we go. When I'm dealing with a sample mean, the way I find the Z score is I subtract, right, whatever that assumed, sorry, not whatever that assumed, whatever that population mean is from the sample mean value that I'm interested in. I then divide by the standard deviation of my sample means, which I know is equal to this equation right here, right? What's in the denominator, right? So I can do this one of two ways. I could, right? Because that's really what I'm dividing by in the denominator. So I could first find what this is. Now we already did that, right? When we took the square root of the variance over the sample size, we found it was 100. And then I could just plug that into the denominator, 3,550 minus 3,700, right? And then divided by that 100. Or if I use this, the formula from the formula sheet, this equation would have been in my denominator and I just plug my values in, I'd end up getting a z-score of, what is this, one point, negative 1 1.5, right? So 3,550 minus 3,700 divided by 100, negative 1.5. So we'll look that up in our, our Z tables. And now this one's kind of easier because I just wanted the area to the left. That's what the table will tell me, right? So I go ahead, I go to that standard normal table, negative 1.50, 0 0.0668, right? So 0 0.0668 should be my answer there, okay? Now right away, we said it had to be less than 0 0.5. I could have ruled out C. Right, because that was greater than 0.5. What if I want the probability that's between 3,500 and 3,700? So I'll go through this in a little bit quick because we're kind of running out of time and I want to make sure I say one or two more things before we get out of here. But really all we're doing, I won't work, work, walk through the entire process, but what was it, 3,500 and 3,700? I want to know what, what the probability is that we see something in between those two values. Well, what would I do there? I'd turn 3,500 into a z-score. I think if I do that, it should be negative two. I can find the area to the left of negative two. If I turn 3,700 into a z-score, what should I have a z-score of? 
Zero. And the area to the left of it should be what? 0.5. So whatever I find the area to the left of that z score of negative two to be, I subtract that from 0.5 and I'll be left with kind of what's in between there, right? So what I originally wanted kind of was what's in between. So I'll take kind of this smaller area, subtract it from the larger probability I found, which is 0.5, and I'll have the probability them in between those two values. Any questions on that one? So I didn't, well, I didn't write it all out, but if we turn this into a z-score, you'll find negative two. So, I mean, you can plug 3,500 in here. Instead, we get a z-score of negative two. Yep. Okay. Um, so one thing I want to mention before we kind of and class. Uh, so I didn't do just so in case anyone's was worried. I didn't do any online quizzes this week since we we're basically doing like a lot of review and things. You know, I know you have a homework and I want you to study for the exam. So those will kind of come back after the exam. But for this week, I'm not I didn't do any I'm not doing any today. Um, the other thing is, so we just pretty much worked through all of practice exam a I think we got through every problem now. So on Monday, I will do some work from practice exam B. Um, even though the exam will be open kind of Monday, like what, 12, 1201, I guess if you really want to stay up till midnight on Sunday and start on it, you, you could do that, I guess. But um, I'll do another review session on Monday, and it, like we would have class. Uh, but for my other section, instead of going through problems from practice exam A, I went through practice exam B first. So you'll see on YouTube, I'm actually posting like two videos every day. Um, at least on Wednesday today, and then probably I'll post two on Monday if I do different things in the different sections. So that way we're not going to get through every problem on practice exam B, but if you look at those videos, you'll, you can find, you know, I tell, tell you what problems I worked through in the video. So you could always, if you're having trouble with one of those on practice exam B, always go and find the problem worked through. Okay. So that's why it looks like there's two videos there. Um, and I'll, I'll, if I, I'll, I'll double check and make sure that it's clear that like, which one was the ones that we worked through in class and then which one's from the other section, okay? Any questions for me? Yeah. Um, it'll basically be like you're working through a hypothesis test problem and I kind of ask you to kind of, you know, what's the p-value, what's the, it'll, so it'll be like, if I took like four or five of the multiple choice questions up from the, like the one we did today on proportions, take off the confidence interval question, the other ones, and I like put it all into a short answer and just ask you to kind of, which, you know, it's good because I can, if you show me all your work and you show me a lot, you know, even if you get say A wrong, I'm not going to grade it like if you got the null alternative wrong, you're going to get the next one wrong. I'll grade it, you know, assuming what you did in part A was correct, even if it, if it wasn't. Um, so it allows me to kind of give a little more partial credit there for those hypothesis test problems. All right, so any other questions before we get out of here today? All right, enjoy your weekend and I will see you guys on Monday.